Okay, yeah, thank you so much for the very nice introduction. Also, thanks so much for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure and honor for me to give a talk here. Now, I think we all know how to manage the successful AI is, but on the other hand, we are also aware that there are still several problems concerning reliability. And in this talk, I would like to take now uh, a graph signal processing viewpoint and tell you um, a bit about which results there already are concerning reliability and where we stand and what we still need to do. I said, I mean, if we look around us, we see that AI uh, has come to basically stay. It will change our society in a more or less radical manner. Think of self-driving cars, robotics, telecommunication, and also in more sensitive areas, like for instance, uh, in the legal sector, but also concerning job applications, for instance. And then certainly in the whole area of sciences from medicine or biology. And then I think lately um, it raised even more attention through through the uh, large foundation models, like for instance, uh, chat GPD, uh, where people are now kind of also worried what happens, uh, what will happen in the future, how we can control it. So we see, I think, tremendous successes in this direction. But then on the other hand, I mean, people are also hesitant. And so there was an interesting incident. It's now already several years ago, four years ago, where there was a big AI conference and one researcher won an award. And in his plenary speech, he said, well, I mean, machine learning, in particular AI, is still at the level of alchemy. Uh, and so his argument was that um, it's not clear why some algorithms work and others don't and which architecture to choose. We are now four years later. We have done a lot of research to build and understand AI in its depths. But still, I mean, I think you all agree that if you train neural networks, it's still a bit of a trial and error. Uh, and so also there are much more warning signs. Um, for instance, Stephen Hawking said the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. I don't think we are at that point yet. I mean, maybe far in the future, we don't know. But what we realize is that there are still, I mean, major challenges concerning reliability of AI. So think, for instance, of problems with safety. There were already accidents involving robots and a self-driving car is after all just a robot. Problems with security, you can hack into self-driving cars, into hospital systems, changing data slightly so that nobody notices and therefore change then also decisions radically. Problems with safety, AI is data prone. We need huge sets of data and so privacy violations happen basically on a daily basis and also problems with responsibility where I mean, I mean, many of the decisions are black box decisions. We cannot explain them at this point. And also depending on the training data, it might need to be might be biased. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that one current major problem worldwide is the lack of reliability of AI technology. Now, I mean, coming from Germany and, and living in Europe, and the same holds for various other areas in the world, um, there is uh, now a strong, let's say, um, pursue concerning reliability to ensure this. So for instance, in the European Union, we have the AI Act, or we are working on having an AI act to ensure reliability. Maybe you've heard on the news that the G7 in Japan, I mean, also now had this uh, Hiroshima protocol to ensure regulations of AI. So there's a lot of things going on. Now we can ask, I mean, what do you need for really ensuring reliability of artificial intelligence? And so from my viewpoint, what we need is to get a deep understanding of what happens. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, it needs a profound theoretical understanding, mathematical understanding, for instance, the training algorithm, where does it converge to and so on. So in my first, the first part now, I mean, I would like to just briefly introduce what are maybe key questions we need to address to really ensure reliability. And then we will delve into some of them in a bit more depth. And I would like to show you what has been done in particular, as said, uh, for graph signal processing. Just starting very, very slow, I mean, uh, just to remind you, and most of you are aware of this, I mean, artificial neural, neural networks are nothing new. They are actually quite old. So everything started in 1943, which met Carlock and Pitts. And so they wanted to introduce artificial intelligence. And what they did was they wanted to mimic the human brain. At least we humans believe we are intelligent. So this seems to be a smart thing to do. Uh, and so, I mean, human brain, we all know, is connected. Well, we have neurons, which are interconnected, and then there are signals passing in many directions. And so they wanted to model an artificial neuron connected to a neural network. And today, these deep neural networks are also one of the main workhorses for AI. So how does it work? Just in a nutshell, and then we are a bit more, let's say, high level. 
Uh, so you have a neuron, you have here signals coming in, which we call X1, X2, X3, and so on. They might be amplified. This is mimicked by these weights. Then the neuron has to decide whether to fire or not. And the model here says, well, I mean, the sum, so the weighted sum of the XIs is then connected or is compared to a bias term. And depending on that, it fires a one or a zero. Uh, so this is a very, very, very simple form of an artificial neuron. Um, when we connect them, what we train are the weights and the bias terms. And certainly you will say, I mean, this is much too simplistic. I mean, outputting a zero and a one will not work. I mean, and I agree. So what people now typically use are the re it's ReLU, it's the rectifiable linear unit, the max of zero and X to then produce the output. Okay, so in a bit more mathematical terms, um, this looks like this. So an artificial neuron takes X1 to Xn to this function. From the previous slide, you see, I mean, you realize the sum and the bias term. And here we now have an activation function, the ReLU, for instance, or the tangents of a poly course, whatever you can think of, uh, to output this. These neurons are then connected um, to a deep neural network. Uh, so here, just looking at this graph, uh, so these are now all artificial neural network, uh, sorry, artificial neurons. So we pass from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And uh, we have here always the input um, components. And then we have the output component. It's always one, and this is then connected to several neurons in the next layer. That's the easiest form. It's a feed-forward neural network. And here you see, I mean, the mathematical formula. Um, so what you, what you see here is, I mean, it's a connection of these affine linear terms, which come from this. And then you always have the activation function, the nonlinear univariate function in between applied component-wise, and then you keep going. Uh, and so this mimics exactly this graph, which you see here on the right-hand side where the weights are now here lying on all these connections and the bias terms and the activation functions in these neurons. Okay, I, I guess you've seen this many times. So this is a neural network. Um, so what do we do with it? Because I said, I would like to show you in the beginning what are the key maybe questions we need to answer concerning neural networks and then also graph neural networks. Um, but uh, let's stick with this setting for a moment. So what do you do? Well, I mean, you have a very complicated function which you want to solve. Uh, maybe it's defined on a lower dimension manifold, like for instance, if you have natural images, it's a classification function. So typically, I mean, people like to separate cats from dogs. Um, so for instance, here you have images of dogs, here you have images of cats, and maybe the function f maps those to the value one and those to the value two. Yeah, but what you have at hand are sample values, so images with their labels. And now you want to train a neural network to approximate the function f. And so what you do is you split now your samples into two sets, the sampling, uh, the training set and the test set. The training you use for training, the test you don't touch, so you, you set aside. The second point then is to select the architecture. Now, so how many neurons, how do you set up this graph of a neural network? Now, so how many neurons to take, how many layers to take, which connection to take, because maybe you don't want to train a fully connected network. You want to set certain edges already equal to zero in the beginning before you start your training process. Okay, so there you have to do a lot of decisions and then you train. Um, this is already a highly complicated procedure. I mean, the algorithm is very easy, but what happens is very complicated because what you do is basically you minimize and optimize over a very ragged landscape and finding the right minimum because it's a highly non-convex function, it's very difficult. Still, I mean, these training algorithms perform quite well on that task, and then you have your neural network, you apply it to the test data, which you get from here, and hopefully things work. Now, this is the easiest form of a neural network. Um, typically, for instance, in areas like imaging sciences, we use convolutional neural networks. So they have a specific form of these uh, weights and biases. Um, so they use convolution because in imaging sciences, well, it doesn't matter whether the cat is now on the left-hand upper corner or the right-hand lower corner. So taking a filter and moving it on the whole image seems to be a good idea. And this is what the convolution does. So it moves this filter now over the image, producing then, I mean, the filtered version. The activation function is then also applied afterwards, similar to, let's say, a normal neural network. 
And then to reduce the dimension in this case, there's another layer, which is a pooling layer, which take always areas of um, the outcome here and either do max pooling. So taking the largest each time in each square or the minimum or an average. Uh, so, so basically, I mean, this architecture looks like this. So you have um, here your image, maybe here you also have the different channels. Um, depending if you have a color image, then you do convolution and um, the ReLU, then you do the pooling. Sorry, it's, I think the resolution is not that great. And then you keep going. Okay, so now what about graphs? Um, a graph neural network is, you can view as a generalization of a normal neural network because you can view, let's say, uh, Euclidean data also as a very special form of a graph. Uh, so you can connect your, your parts there. So a graph signal, I mean, here will be graph nodes mapping to some feature vector, like you see here. And um, I think I don't need to tell you why this is important. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be here. There are very exciting applications in this direction. I mean, recommender systems, also fake news detection, social networks, also chemistry molecules. There's a great deal of research going uh, in the area of AI now to analyze molecules, predict, let's say, the folding of molecules, as you might know, for instance, from alpha fold. So how to adapt now this um, AI architecture to this situation? Um, again, you have, let's stick now with the convolutional setting. You have a convolution layer. You have an activation layer. You have a pooling layer. Um, the convolution layer, there are actually two main approaches in this direction. One is a spatial approach. So you have, again, like a filter window, which you move over the graph. And basically, you aggregate feature information from the neighboring nodes. Yeah, so these are the so-called message passing neural networks, or you can do it in free domain. Uh, so you can use the convolution theory, um, then multiply your filter in the free domain. Um, and uh, yeah, and have the filter uh, defined that way. We will discuss that in a bit more depth uh, very soon. Okay, so basically you have these two different approaches, spectral graph convolution neural networks and the spatial ones so with the message path. The activation function is not that difficult. Yeah, so you just apply it component wise now to each weight. Um, and the pooling, there are different ways. I don't want to go too much into the details because it's very technical. I mean, what people sometimes do is this coarse ring, so collapsing nodes, um, and then that way reducing the size of the graph. Okay, um, so what are now the key questions um, we, we need to answer in particular concerning reliability? As you saw, I mean, from the workflow, what we first do is we first um, apply, uh, we first need to decide upon the architecture. So the first question is what's called expressivity. So we want to understand which architecture to choose uh, and which affects the performance of deep learning the best. So there, that's usually a purely approximation theoretic question. Um, the second is learning. So stochastic gradient descent, why does it converge to what does it converge? Um, because it's highly non-convex, the problem, and it typically, for some reason, usually converges to good local minima. Well, this is, these are approximate, uh, optimization questions, and sometimes even now also very exotic areas, like algebraic geometry is, is thrown onto that because uh, people want to understand the shape of the local minima and then deduce from that which local minima are maybe the best. Maybe the holy grail of everything is generalization. So why does um, the neural network uh, transfer that good to non, uh, to non known data to unknown data to test data? Uh, so that usually use a lot of probability theory statistics. And a very different area is now, let's say we have our neural network, we trained it. Um, but we don't know, yeah, maybe, maybe we bought the algorithm or maybe our colleague trained it. We tr don't trust her or him. And we want to now understand how it reaches decisions. Uh, and so this is an area of explainability. It asks the question, I have a trained neural network. How does it reach decisions? And maybe at last one direction, which I think is completely, or entire, or not completely, let's say, but to a large extent neglected. But I think it's actually absolutely crucial, which is limitation. Uh, I mean, um, 
because neural networks are not a Swiss army knife. Huh? So they have limitations and I think this is something which also needs to be explored. And in this talk, I would like to delve now a little bit deeper into uh, generalization, explainability and limitations um, and show you what um, maybe has been done, some, some of that. So let's start with Swiss generalization. Now, so generalization asks, I mean, the general question because what is really amazing is that neural networks perform that well in the very high parametric regime. Yeah, so if you ask a practitioner which neural network to take, they usually tell you take the largest which fits in your GPU. So this seems to be amazing. Um, and this figure, which appeared already, you see, in 2019, people are still aiming to explain it, uh, kind of shows this phenomenon. So this comes from statistics. So let me walk you through that. Uh, let's first take a look at the left-hand side. So this is uh, the size of the neural network, the capacity of the hypothesis class. And this is the error. And certainly, if the network becomes larger, the training error goes down. I mean, that's, yeah, so, I mean, the, the network fits the data better. But the test error, after some point, goes up again. And so this is what's called this overfitting phenomena. Uh, and so the reason is, that now if the training data, if you have very few training data and the network tries to enclose it as much as possible, then, I mean, for instance, if you have outliers, I mean, it will enclose it in such a way that if you have new points, it becomes very artificial and the new points will not be classified correctly. Uh, so this overfitting phenomena is well known. And so this is very well explained. But now what happens truly in for a neural network is this region. You see the left-hand side coincides with what we have here, but then there's a right-hand side. Yeah, and so as I now increase the size of the network further, you see then the error again goes down. Yeah, and so this is this phenomenon taking the largest network which fits in your GPU. And so you see, I mean, there for Google and so on, they have these huge, uh, huge servers, huge compute uh, to train these large neural networks. And I think we see also the effect with the foundation models we experience these days. Uh, so pe people, I mean, tried a lot of things to explain that. We see dimension, try to how complexity in your attention kernel and so on. So now I would like to show you one result for graphs, for graph convolutional neural networks, uh, which we can actually show off completely. It's not the full question, but it's a part of the question. And I would like to show you what you can do in that respect. So now for graphs. Um, what you certainly also want, that's graph neural networks generalized to data which are not seen in the training. No? That's the question of generalization. Now, so let's assume, I mean, I have one of these graphs. Let's say this graph was in my training and this graph is in my test set. So I hope that my neural network, my graph neural network, which are trained, has the same repercussion on both. Yeah? Because these graphs look kind of alike. And so the question is, yeah, if you have two graphs, which, which look kind of alike, and what we mean by that, we will make precisely in a moment. Yeah? So if I have two graphs, which look kind of alike, which model the same phenomena, and I have one of them in my training data, then as said, I would like my new network to have the same repercussion on the other one. Yeah, so you see, this is a sub problem of the full generalization problem. Now, if we look at, let's say, classes of graphs, and if I have one in my training data, I would like that then the generalization happens indeed to others in the same class. And I would like to show you that we can actually completely analyze this phenomena, um, so get precise error bonds. I mean, yeah, don't worry. I mean, it will not be too mathematical. I just want to explain it in a more high-level fashion. Okay, so first, I mean, we need to talk a bit about convolution, I already said. Now, so how do we define the convolution? Now, let me remind you um, what the graph Laplacian is. Uh, so if D is my degree matrix and W is my adjacency matrix, then there's a notion of the graph Laplacian, which is just the difference between those. And I can also normalize it. Uh, so this now, so in, in the future, I mean, I will avoid this N. So this graph Laplacian is self adjoint and so it has eigenvalues, eigenvectors. So these are the frequencies and these are the Fourier modes. And what it does is it kind of encapsulates the geometry of the graph. Uh, so if you look at the eigenvectors, you see, um, yeah, so this is now drawn in a continuous fashion, everything, but in everything is on the graph. You see you hear different frequencies. And then as you 
continue to, let's say, higher frequencies, you see here the frequencies also much more, uh, yeah, higher frequencies appear. Yeah, so the graph Laplacian is now adapted to this particular structure of the graph and encapsulates that in a certain manner. Yeah, so it's a kind of generalization of, let's say, the Fourier, Fourier analysis. So it's, it's Fourier analysis on graphs. Okay, so now with this, um, there's a very typical definition of a convolution on graphs. Uh, so what is usually done is you have a filter sequence, Cj, and then you have your function on the graph. And then the convolution is defined in this way, where the uj's are now eigenvectors of the graph Laplace. Now, so this is the standard way to do that. Um, but this causes, causes a problem. Now, so this is the filter sequence here. This causes several problems. First of all, you need to compute the eigen decomposition, which is already very complicated. And for friendship graphs, if they are too huge, it's basically impossible. Secondly, there's no fast Fourier transform for graphs, not general, at least, yeah? only for very specific form of graphs. That's another problem. But even worse, if we do it that way, then we will get a graph neural network, which is not transferable. Why? Well, you see, what I certainly want is that if I have a graph and I perturb it slightly, I would like that my graph neural network has the same repercussion on those two. Um, I mean, a small perturbation should not make a huge difference. Now, if I perturb my graph slightly, these eigenvectors could actually change much more. And since this is fixed, this action C will change a lot. Yeah, so that makes it not transferable. Yeah. So with this definition, we will run into a huge problem. And now we pull something out of the head, which is kind of a beautiful theory. It puts, let's say, a bit more continuous viewpoint on everything. And you will see also in the talk, I mean, usually taking a continuous viewpoint to graphs has actually sometimes a huge advantage. Yeah, so this, what I will, would like to use is called functional calculus. I mean, if you don't know that, don't worry. Um, it's a kind of very beautiful, let's say, um, approach from mathematics. And it does now the following. Yeah, so basically we will change now how we define the field. So this functional calculus does the following. I have a T, an operator T like the graph Laplacian, and it tells me I can apply a function to it. Now it, it, it gives a meaning to, let's say, a function now applied to this T. Now, so that looks very strange, but here with me a moment. Now, and so the decomposition then looks like this. So basically this, these lambda j's are, are substituted by G of lambda j. Yeah, but, but basically what it does is it tells me what g of t is. And if my g is a rational function, then I can write this also down very precisely. <coughs> okay, so what I now do is I replace this coefficient sequence cj. So the filter is now not the coefficient sequence cj, but it is a function g. Uh, so I go from the discrete to the continuous word. Uh, so this is now how I define my filters. So my G is now the filter, and I apply my G to the graph Laplacian, and that gives me this formula. And you can compare it to what we had before. Yeah, so basically what you see is now this G, this CJ, which caused the problem before because it was fixed, is now replaced by G of lambda J. And you see now if I change my, if the UJs change a lot because I perturb my graph, this was fixed, so it can, could not counterbalance this, but this can counterbalance it. Yeah? So if I perturb my graph slightly, these can change a lot, but then this counterbalance it, and this remains stable. Uh, so this solves the instability problem. It also solves the computational problem, because I don't need to compute the eigen decompositions anymore. Since if my g is a rational function, I can write this down precisely. If, let me go back. Yeah, so I can write it down precisely. I don't need to compute the UJs anymore. Okay, so this is now what we take. So these are specific spectral filters for graph convolutional neural networks, which are hopefully then transferable. Okay, so the second question we need to answer is um, what do we mean by transferability? There are various ways 
you can view this, you can say the easiest is maybe I perturb my graph slightly, then these two graphs model the same phenomenon. I can say, and this is the second viewpoint, and again, this continuous viewpoint, I have something like a continuous space sitting on top, and my graph is a discretization of it. Now, and if I have, let's say, two graphs which come from the same continuous space, then these model the same phenomena. And then there's a graphone approach. So a graphone is like a continuous object, um, like a continuous graph in a certain sense. And you have sequences of graphs which converge to this graphone. And if two of the graphs come from the same sequence, then we can say these are model the same phenomena. So I would like to take now this viewpoint. But what I say, I mean, also holds for the other. Okay, so topological space, I mean, if you're not familiar with that, don't worry. Um, just think of something, let's say, continuous space from which you can sample. Um, uh, so the relation now is we have our weighted graph. And so we have connections between nodes, which are where we have assigned weights. And our continuous space on top is just a space where we have points and we know the notion of a distance. Uh, and so this is what's called metric space. So we have something on top where we have points and distance. Uh, and so now, I mean, if I sample and um, my distance between two points goes up, then the weight on the discrete object, go, the, the weight goes down. Uh, so that makes, makes sense. So in a nutshell, if graphs, graph represents the same phenomena, if they come from the same continuous space lying on top. Okay. So now let, let me explain to you what we do just in this figure. Um, so what we need to do is now, we need to compare the repercussion on, on different graphs. Now, so I, I have my graph, I, I put it in, let's say, sorry, I have my graph and I have a transferred version of it. I put it in the same graph neural network and I need to see how the filters act on that. Now, so basically I need to always move from the one graph to the other graph. Uh, and remember, these two graphs are connected by this continuous space. So what I can now always do is I can always move via this continuous space. Okay, so I have these two graphs which um, mimic the same phenomena. They come from the same, yeah, so they are sampling of the same metric space. Uh, and uh, let's assume I have a function which is now defined on this, this object, this continuous space, which we call M. So now if I would like to compare the repercussion um, with let's say the same filter because I pass it to the same neural network. I first need to bring things down on the graph. Huh? Okay, so I sample. Huh? So I bring things down on the graph. I have like a sampling operator. I have now my function on the graph. Now I need to filter it. Remember, I would like to, I pass it to the same neural network. I have this filter G and remember how the filter G is applied. If I go back, let me go back. Oh, where was it? Yeah. Yeah, this way. Yeah, so I apply it to the graph Laplacian. Now the graph Laplacian is different. These are two different graphs. Yeah? So I apply now the same filter uh, of the graph Laplacian to this sampled version. Now I have everything on the graph. I bring it back to the continuous space, and then I can compare it. Uh, so I lift it with some reconstruction. And then I compare it. Uh, so this is basically now how also the proof and everything works. I mean, more complicated than what I say here. Um, but what you can then show with this is um, that the transferability of such a graph convolutional network. So if you pass through two graphs, which mimic the same phenomena, you can estimate it by the transferability of the graph Laplacian and the consistency error. Well, the consistency error depends on the density of the sample. Yeah, and I mean, so this is basically the, the whole full theorem in its glory. I don't want to go too much into the details there. So what basically you see is, I mean, you have here these two parts. This is passing one graph through the neural network. This is passing the other. And you have a very explicit estimate, which depends, for instance, on the number of layers here of this dimension of a certain space. Um, you have here also Lipschitz constant of filters and so on. Okay. So... One can also do the same for um, the graphone setting. And here you see a bit, I mean, I don't have time to go too much in the details of what a graphone is. So graphones are, let's say, continuous objects as said. Um, so for instance, 
if you have random graphs, I mean, they, they converge, let's say, to a constant Raphone and so on. So it's like a limit object, beautiful theory, and you can do the same there. And for message passing neural networks, so where you define your filters in the spatial domain, you can also do something similar. So, yeah, so here you see message passing uh, neural networks, they put a filter on the graph. So the network, neural network puts a filter on the graph and always aggregates from the neighboring nodes. So that's the filter procedure there. And so you can also do use similar ideas in that setting. And so this is also quite consistent with uh, numerical results. So what you see here is for instance, I mean, so one is the, uh, the spectral and the spatial neural network. So this is a spectral neural network, this is a spatial neural network. And you see, I mean, in certain instances, the spectral one with these uh, functional analytic filters, a uh, functional calculus filters perform uh, even better. No? So here, this is an example where you have an image, you have different resolutions and you just train your neural network on one resolution and you check how it transfers to other resolutions. Ah, and so here you also see another where you have graph perturbations. Um, and uh, so this linear relation is very consistent with what we proved theoretically. Okay, so this was just a short excursion into generalization. Um, which shows that in certain instances, I mean, you can actually really uh, show a complete result. And so what I showed you was for uh, this transferability phenomenon. So let's now delve a little bit also into explainability, um, because I think that's a very exciting area. And I think it needs a lot more research, uh, because that will be very important in the future, because you will always have new networks where you don't know how they were trained and where they come from. And you need to analyze how they reach decisions. Uh, so this is typically the easiest form which people do. Um, we will come to graphs in a moment, but let me also start again, I mean, with the Euclidean setting. Mm, so I have a neural network which classifies this as a three. And then the explainability approach could give an image like this, indicating that the neural network looked at these openings of the three, which makes a lot of sense because that distinguishes a three from an eight. Mm. Yeah, but maybe, uh, and also maybe it looked here in this, in this area. Uh, so this is like a heat map indicating at each point how relevant that pixel was for the neural network. Uh, so this is basically the idea of what people aim to do. But then the question is, I mean, what, what are optimal relevance maps, how to compare? Also, maybe you don't want to assign a relevance score to each pixel. Uh, maybe combinations of pixels are much more important than every single pixel. So think, for instance, you would like to analyze or a neural network would like to analyze whether something is a, is a lake or not. Then maybe not every pixel is important, but maybe the waves on the lake or something. So the vision in that area is you want to question AI as you would like to question a human about an explanation. And you can imagine how difficult that is. I mean, we are very far from it, but now with the new natural language models, with foundation models, we might be even closer than we think. Um, and also what sometimes is neglected at the, the explainability approach itself needs to be reliable. Yeah, I mean, if I only get fancy pictures, that's nice, but I would like to, yeah. So if I want to check reliability of AI and my explainability approach is not reliable, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, so let me show you one result. Um, which you also derived in that setting. It comes from information theory, rate distortion theory. So maybe the electrical engineers among you uh, might know about that. Um, so what, what is the basic idea there? You have two persons, Alice and Bob. Alice sends a message to Bob. She cannot send the complete message. She only sends it as a special rate. Bob has to decode it and he will make an error. And the error he makes is the distortion. So you want to keep the rate small, but also the distortion. And now we phrase this explainability approach in that setting. So Alice has now the original image and a neural network. Bob for decoding also has the neural network. Now Alice sends parts of the image to Bob, hopefully the relevant part. No? Now Bob has a problem because he cannot put this part in his neural network. He has to first bring it back to the image size. And to least distort it, um, he maybe obfuscates with random pixels. Uh, and so then he passes it through. So the rate is now how many pixels are sent. 
You want to send few pixels. We aim for sparsity of the explanation. And the error, the distortion is the difference between the results if you put both in the neural net. Okay, so, so what you aim for is now you would like to keep the rate small, but also the distortion small. And if you're working in optimization, you will say this, you cannot compute, it's NP hot. No, I agree with you, so this is very hard, it's NPPP complete. But as usual, um, if something is hard, we can relax. And so there's a relaxed version of it, which is solving this optimization problem. But you see now, you have a very precise problem, which you can also analyze mathematically. Uh, so we have here the distortion, and then we would like to keep um, the explanation. So these are the relevance scores at each pixel sparse. Yeah? So the L1 norm promotes sparsity, so you'll have very concise explanations. Well, so in this, yeah, allows some mathematical performance. Yeah, so here, yeah, unfortunately, I hope you can see it. It's very difficult to see. Uh, so this neural network classifies this as a dog, and here you see different explanations. So here you see ours is very concise in some sense. I mean, you basically see the outline of the head. So the neural network apparently looked at the head of the dog to make that decision. And you can also compare it, um, let's say, objectively in a sense, by looking at the rate versus the distortion. And so ours performs the best with a very small rate. You get also a very low distortion. Um, you can say, well, okay, that's very unfair because your approach was actually tuned to that. And to a certain extent, I agree. But on the other hand, this is actually the measure which also in other papers is taken. Okay, so going beyond, there are two um, ways to go beyond. One is to now not look at single pixels, but to look at combinations of pixels. And for instance, I don't know if you're familiar with wavelets, so this is a specific representation system. So wavelets look, look like this. Um, so you can decompose an image into these wavelets. And so basically this gives you a natural clustering of pixels. The other is certainly, I mean, extension to graph neural networks. Um, so there you can now wonder whether to take masks. So these, um, uh, so if I go back, what I mean by mask was, was this, uh, so subset. Yeah, so whether you take masks for the feature vectors or the edges or for both, because now you have these two different components. But basically what you then want is you would like to know which feature, which parts of the feature vectors were important for the decision and from your input graph and maybe which edges. No? Okay, so this is, I mean, it's actually not that difficult to generalize it because I mean, basically you can mask uh, also the feature vectors. You can then obfuscate here, for instance, I mean, with random points. Um, so basically extending into the graph setting is not, not such a problem. Let me, I will show you then also one result, but let me now first, I mean, just talk a bit about that and then we'll come back to this. Um, so for the first, um, how does it work? There's actually a very nice comparison to compression. Um, yeah, so from compression, what you can do is you have, or what you do, basically, you have your image, you compute a decomposition like in wavelets, like for JPEG 2000, for instance, you select the largest entries, you replace the others with zero, and then you reconstruct. Uh, and so this is here why, why it's so efficient to store it. And then you hope that the images are quite similar. Now, what you do is a bit different. So you take your image, you compute the decomposition like a wave transform, you select the largest entries, but now you replace the others with random noise. You reconstruct, and now you not compare the images but you compare it through the lens of the neural network because that's what interests you. But basically from the philosophy, so this extension of our rate distortion approach to wavelets is kind of in the spirit of compression. And so then, I mean, what you can do for instance is the following. So here you see um, a city map where the red dots are cell phone users and the white blob is the cell tower and the neural network computes this black and white background. And now you say, can say this doesn't make any sense because here having an area of bad reception, if you stand right in front of the cell tower, should not be there. Yeah, I mean, here 
if people stand here, they should have amazing reception because they have, I mean, basically the cell tower in their side. But then, I mean, what we can do with explainability approaches is we can ask how the neural network came to that decision. And so the explanation was it looked at these structures and indeed these cell phone users have bad reception. And so what we found out is later on that the neural network in fact did the right decision because there was a building missing in the city map. Huh? So you can also detect faulty data. And here maybe a bit funny example. So the neural network said this is a diaper. Ah, obviously, it's obviously the man with the dog. And so this is a screw. And so now, I mean, you can overlay that with the explanation and you see basically what the neural network has seen to reach that wrong decision. Now, so you can, so I, I, I overlay it. And so what you see here, this looks a bit like a baby and then the diaper is not that far off. And this looks a bit like a screw. Now, so that way you can see why wrong decisions were taken and then counteract to that. And so here, one explanation, one, let's say, example also from, from graph neural networks. So here, uh, looked at mutagenic molecules and um, they were correctly classified. So this is a different explainability approach for graph neural networks, which um, is typically used. So this is the new one. And so what you observe is that the explanation here is much more precise and it's more concise because it's tuned towards sparsity. And indeed, I mean, these structures, these NO2, this is typically responsible for it being mutagenic. No? So in that sense, I mean, the neural network we see looked at something also at structures which made a lot of sense. Here, the explanation, I mean, was a bit diverse, but here it showed precisely what the neural network in fact looked at. Okay, so let me just in the last maybe two or three minutes, um, talk a little bit about limitations because it's very dear to my heart and I think it's uh, should one should put a bit more emphasis on. Okay, so as I said, I mean, um, neural networks and AI is not a Swiss army knife. I mean, they have limitations. And so the question I would like to ask is, we train our neural networks on digital hardware, yeah? so on GPUs. So we break everything down to zero and ones. And this has to cause some limitations somehow, because usually problems are of a continuous nature. So a computable problem, there's actually in computer science, if you're a computer scientist, you know about computability, a beautiful theory. So a computable problem is one for which the input-output relation can be computed on a digital machine for any given accuracy. If something is not computable, if you can theoretically show it's not computable, certainly you can put it in your computer and you will get something out. So that's that's for sure. But you could have limited precision and also you, you will not have any guarantee of correct. Uh, so even if you have a beautiful theoretical result, I mean, you cannot really check, I mean, how good the outcome is. And there's a model for a digital machine, which you might be aware of, which is a Turing machine. So it's believed that everything which you can compute on a Turing machine, you can compute on a computer and vice versa. And as I said, that's a discrete object, whereas Often in scientific computing, we have continuous problems. Now, so not going into the details, it's a very simple model, elegant, very beautiful. So this is a rigorous model basically for GPUs and forever where, where we these days compute things. Okay, so what we could show is that in fact, I mean, the solution to here inverse problems, so typical imaging sciences, anything what you ask is an inverse problem. It's not too computable by a neural network and also not by a graph neural network. Um, and this is certainly a problem because, as said, I mean, today computations are almost exclusively performed on digital hardware. So I should say, I mean, this is not a problem of the problem we want to solve. It's a problem on the, of the hardware we compute things on. Yeah, so what is the effect of that? Well, I mean, we cannot find an algorithm, a general algorithm, which will give us the result for any given accuracy. The outcome is also not reliable and it could point towards why we see often these robustness problems and instabilities in artificial intelligence. So this seems, I mean, like a dead end, but there's a way out. And also theory tells us what the way out is. Because what we can show is, that on an analog machine, and there's an, let's say, um, so I said, 
the Turing machine. The Turing machine is a model for the discrete hardware. There is a model also for analog hardware, which is so-called Blumschuk's mail machine. There, suddenly things become computable. So if we go from the discrete to the continuous and analog world, um, things become computable. Huh? So basically, it's if you think about it historically, it's, it's backwards. Huh? So we first looked at analog hardware, we went to digital hardware, and now we see that, I mean, digital hardware has problems, we might need to go back to the analog world. And there are actually very exciting future developments if you follow the news. Yeah? So we, we already have, I mean, neuromorphic chips, which are already being produced. So neuromorphic chips are uh, a much more closer model of the human brain. They are based on spiking neural networks. There's biocomputing, computing in single cells, also quantum computing. And I don't mean the quantum computing with qubits. What I mean is here the two quantum computing, for instance, using photonics. Ah, and so, in fact, I mean, we, we proved, let me not go into the details, that there are various problems concerning computability for classification problems, for computing the pseudo inverse, and so on. So, but maybe you need to not go completely in the analog world, but maybe you could augment the digital hardware by analog hardware where it's necessary. Okay, so let me let me finish uh, with, with some conclusions. Um, I mean, from my viewpoint, we live in really exciting times. I think AI has tremendous potential and we just need to use it the right way. And we currently still have this problem with reliability aspects, which we need to overcome to be to ensure that our algorithms are really trustworthy. I took a bit of a theoretical viewpoint um, concerning reliability for in particular graph neural networks. Uh, so these were certain directions. We delved a little bit deeper into generalization aspects, explainability aspects. I talk a bit about uh, limitations and maybe then uh, for the future, uh, the need to consider all the different hardware platforms. Um, and let me, since I talked a lot about reliable AI, let me also mention a very small advertisement at the end um, that in Munich, we just started actually a school, a Conrad School School of Excellence, particularly for reliable AI. It's a structured master plus PhD program set up between both universities, TU Munich and LMU Munich. And you see, I mean, the areas here also mathematical algorithmic foundations is one particular focus uh, among four. And so with this, I'd like to conclude and thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks for the excellent talk and the great overview of the field. And I'm wondering, so you, you, you mentioned many interesting properties of neural networks, and what I cannot fit in is, is the robustness. If it's tightly connected, reliability, and leaving it out seems a little, I don't know, ignorant. So, <laughs> yeah, th thanks for the question. So, first of all, I mean, so for instance, the generalization aspect uh, already gives error bounds. So, if you have these error bounds for generalization, then basically this takes care of the robustness problem. If you have an error bound, then you know, I mean, the outcome will be in that range. Then, um, what I said in the end uh, concerning limitations, this touches upon these, <clears throat> sorry, about these robustness aspects. But then, I mean, what I didn't talk about was, I mean, for instance, if you mean adversarial examples, that's right. So there are some results in this direction, but I think, I mean, much more has to be done. And also I'm wondering, I mean, how far one can get if one considers this last point concerning computability. Yeah, so I think for me, I mean, this is actually a crucial point. So one might need to resolve this first before then completely resolving the problem on robustness. But thanks for mentioning that. Oh, so you mean as as input? So if you have graphical models and you you have, you, you use it as input for your neural network? Yeah, um, so you, you mean concerning generalization? Um, 
I mean, so for generalization, I said our model is we have graphs and uh, we have, let's say, graphs which mimics the same phenomena. So there we have the definition. Um, now, if you say if you have graphical models, if you can fit this and you can say you can define it in this way that you have, let's say, this overlaying continuous space, then yes. But I mean, immediately it does not apply to that in that sense. Uh, now, now explainability is the question is I have one graph as an input. And my graph neural network will reach a decision. And then I want to know which aspects of my initial graph were most relevant for that decision. So in that sense, it doesn't take care of any model for the input space. Yeah, so it's just a single, a single input, which you then want to analyze. So in that sense there, I mean, graphical models won't appear in a natural way. Hello? Hello? Hello. It's about the generality, you know, interpretability. I feel like every time I see this kind of presentation, people take simplistic models, uh, very easy to study, that you are not much of a good. And now in deep learning communities, there are like transformers, there are regularization classes, and there are a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the hope to have? Uh, we have models that can be easily understood in the world in which the models change faster than the theoretical models. Yeah, excellent point. Really, I mean, really. So, um, yeah. So, so let, let me let me answer it in two ways. I mean, first of all, you see, I mean, this last part concerning limitations is, I think, something like a fundamental truth. So there, I mean, one, one can see that there are fundamental problems now. The first part um, concerning transferability, I agree with you that these are very special situations. So the question is, if you now go to real world data, to which extent you can, uh, it, it generalizes basically. I mean, the numerical results showed that, but um, what, what I also see is, yeah, yeah, there are transformers. I mean, let's say the architectures develop in a rapid way and also the, the the type of data uh, so i mean if, if you if you model data in a particular way but now you have these foundation models which basically crawl the whole internet and and take input from that i mean to which extent you can analyze this theoretically i don't know i mean we, we have to see uh transformers i mean there are also some let's say first theoretical results uh, and from my viewpoint i mean really to get reliability in transversalness it's essential to understand it and so I think what we also see now with ChatGPT is that, um, I mean, it shows impressive results, but you, you also encounter these problems. So if you really have applications where you need trustworthiness, the question is, I mean, can, can you use it? To which extent can you use it? So therefore, I think the theoretical viewpoint is important, but I agree with you that, yeah, I mean, since research goes that fast, I mean, it's the question, I mean, to which extent, I mean, always the newest development, how long it will take until the newest development is analyzed. But so let, let me also say that, um, for instance, yeah, in, in, in Europe, the uh, EU Act uh, requires, for instance, uh, algorithmic transparency. Um, and so here, for instance, with these last results, we have extensions which show that, I mean, that is often not possible for digital hardware. So in that sense, I mean, it can really also give contributions to the actual stage of what is required for reliability from a legal viewpoint. Hello. I'm Bob. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, so you're, uh, you know, uh, you are re leading to the new type of uh, computing, like uh, analog computing and so forth. But if those analog computing and then those new type of computation uh, scheme basically is very reliable, then that's probably the case. But often, you know, those analog computing and so forth itself contains certain, you know, unreliability and so forth. So it looks to me, you need to include all these reliability limitations into the also that uh, final you know, analog computing portion too, right? Yes. And also there are a lot of, uh, Considering uh, you know comparison with the human brain and so forth, those I'm curious uh, you know, what you say about the redundancy of all this. I completely agree with you. I mean, analog computing at this point is not at a stage where it's absolutely reliable. Now, I mean, 
So you see um, this also on, uh, let's say, in particular quantum computing and so on. So what I'm just saying, I mean, was with this model for analog computing, this bloom troops mail model, we can show that things become computable. Now, realizing that in hardware is a very different ball. Yeah, and I think there need to be a lot of more years of research in that direction. So I think the, the statement I, I just wanted to make is that there is a fundamental problem with, with digital computing, with digital hardware, and we need to think in that direction. But I completely agree with you. It's um, we, we cannot do it, let's say, right right away. I mean, also uh, from an engineering viewpoint, I mean, there need to be much more developments. Yeah. Well, thank you, Justin. Keep uh, in fact with the schedule. I'll wrap it up here. We have plenty of time during breaks and so forth to continue the discussion. So just uh, let's thank again, Peter. Uh, <laughs>